we just praise you for the blessings of this day. We thank you for the time that we have had to gather together to hear your word, to learn your will, to be prepared to move forward. So, Lord, we thank you for all that you have laid out before us and all that you will lay out before us. And so, Lord, we thank you for coming and being with us this afternoon as we go forward. Lord, help us, guide us, lead us, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we just want to uh, welcome everyone back uh, to our preparedness training this afternoon. And I do have just a couple of announcements. Um, we do want to take a love offering. We want to be able to bless the speakers and to bless the church. And so, um, I don't know, who's good at this? Brandy? <laughs> Can you get a partner and maybe somebody can help you? Uh, we'll we'll take a take a, a offering at this time, and um, the checks can be made if you want to write a check to a Glow International or I mean Kentucky Glow. I'm sorry, uh, Kentucky Glow, and um, we will uh, be sure that those resources are distributed uh, in a way that blesses the this ministry and the speakers today. Um, so we are very delighted uh, to be back this afternoon. Another announcement that I want to share with you is that the resources on the table, the books, are for display only. Actually, um, those are our books, and I hope to take those back with me when we leave here today. So those really aren't for taking home uh, with you. So um, if we could make sure that the books are on the table by the time we leave, that'd be great. If you want to look at them while you're here, please help yourself. Um, so this afternoon, we have a, um, a great lineup, and this is how our afternoon is going to look. Um, we have General Howard Hunt, and April, can you come up here? <laughs> uh, we have General Howard Hunt, and Howard is going to um, have about 30 minutes, um, give or take a little, and uh, as an opening statement. And then Lisa Marie Bowling is going to do the same thing. And then we are going to have a question and answer session at the end. So, and Mercedes Skaggs will join in that. So please hold your questions until the end. And then when we get to that point uh, for... Um, the benefit of the audience online, uh, they will repeat the questions and then answer the questions. Uh, so April, I, I'm, I'm asking you to come up, and I'm sorry I meant to do this before this moment, but I want you to introduce your husband, and I also want you to introduce Lisa Marie when the time comes, so we will call you back. So thank you all very much. Well, I have the privilege of introducing to you my four, my husband of 44 years come August of this year. <laughs> and he's just been just such a God blessing to me and our family and so faithful, such a hard worker, so determined. I mean, he gets a job and he just follows it through until it's done. He just seems to know how to crank it out. I just look at him sometimes and I say, you get so much done. <laughs> so anyway, um, retired Brigadier General Howard Hunt, also a former uh, county judge executive for Boyle County, just uh, if you'd come. He's been in over uh, 45 countries and um, let's see, all, all but two states in the nation. So he's done a little traveling in his time. So God bless you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. That, that, <clears throat> One of the nicest introductions I've ever had. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me okay. I'm, I, I normally, my voice as a general will project without the microphone, but Laura said we're recording, so use the microphone. And I will. There's three things I want to talk to you about in my travels of 35 years in the military that uh, military exist to train and be prepared for circumstances that are required to defend our country, okay? And so training and preparation is, is almost something that I've lived by throughout most of my life. But what I want to let you know, and this was news to me when I started thinking about preparation and speaking today, and I talked to Lisa Marie 
bowling a while ago about this. There are 159 times that Scripture addresses preparation in the Bible. And I'm going to read three of them, just three of them, and they're very short, very short. 1 Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Proverbs 22, 3. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. And the last one, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just think about those things. I have a couple handouts, and most of, most of you, I think, have received those. And as a military person, you would talk, I would talk about things like level of war, courses of actions, and different things in state and stuff like that. On the, uh, uh, the, this sheet that is labeled levels of warfare, I break down the three levels of warfare, strategic, operational, and tactical. On the left side is the traditional military uh, point of view of those kinds of things. On the right side are the spiritual correlation to those types of level of warfare. And we are constantly in a battle. The devil uh, wants to rule the world, wants to rule the earth, and we're constantly in a battle. So those things that the enemy will throw in our path, we need to be prepared to deal with both spiritually and in life, okay? And we're talking about both of those today. And I'm not going to reread each of those, but read those levels of war, warfare. And on the next page in the color, all the, the color is the planning elements. And right at the top are things for you to consider in your life where you live. Uh, situational awareness are things going on in your sphere of life your family your work your your areas in which you enjoy uh, activities be situationally aware I know that when I was overseas and traveling overseas there's a lot of uncertainty in things and in an unfamiliar area but there's all kinds of techniques that you can learn, like when you go into a restaurant, you look for exit doors. You put your wall to the back so you can see activity in front of you and nothing behind you so there's no surprises. Simple things like that. That's being prepared for your, aware, for your environment where you are. On this, there's all kinds of military things, and some of them you don't really need to know, but if, like Sun Tzu said, who was the great Chinese military philosopher, if you know your enemy better than you know yourself, then you, will, you should be successful, okay? And there's a couple of quotes there by him, but what I wanted to talk about in being situationally aware, there's a, there's a systematic approach to that, and a lot of people who have not been in the military are not aware of that. So this is what this is. And when we talk about commanders and leaders, just insert yourself there. Okay, because you're the most important person that has this information and it gives you a mechanism or a procedure to make the best decisions you can to survive and flourish. Okay, uh, an estimate of situation is a process of reasoning by which a commander considers all circumstances affecting the situation and arrives at a decision as to a course of action to be taken to accomplish the mission. That's the military uh, term for estimate of situation. Apply that to your life, to your daily life, where you are. In developing courses of action, a plan, a course of action is a plan, a set of intended actions through which one intends to achieve a goal. Your goal in preparation for 
things that may come our way is survivability, is to live, is to life, is to have life. Now, down below that are the different courses of action criteria, sustainability, I mean suitability, feasibility, acceptability, distinguishability, which is the, the courses of action that are different for different uh, scenarios, and then completeness. All of those will give you a process and procedure or thought processes to help you in your given situation to analyze how you can best get through it successfully. To the end state, that's our goal. The end state is a set of required conditions that define a successful achievement of our objectives, which is to live and live well. Okay, I really think, you know, uh, if you've been listening to um, Dutch Sheets and he's given 15, there's a lot of prophecy going on about uh, things, a great shaking in September time frame. Who knows what that will be? We don't know. It may not, it, it might be an intention getter, okay? We don't know what it'll be. But when I hear the great shaking, it reminds me of why preparedness is important. Because the greatest earthquake shaking to ever hit the continental United States occurred in 1811 and 1812 and in the Madrid Fault in the Madrid, Missouri and Mark Tree, Arkansas. If it were to happen today at the same levels it happened in 1811, which is 8.0 plus, 8.2 was estimated, the seismic activity, it would virtually destroy the city of St. Louis. Last time it happened, the Mississippi River flowed backwards. There were sand fissure, fissures, geysers that shot 30 foot into the air with sand coming up out of the land, and the land through liquefaction actually rode like ocean waves, okay? Bells rang in Boston, Massachusetts. Bricks, if it happened today, the same level, brick facades would fall off their buildings as far away as Huntington, West Virginia, okay? Be prepared. What do you do when something like that happens, which is exacerbated, in my personal opinion, by the cave systems throughout the, the uh, topography of Kentucky? Mammoth Cave, it's like a megaphone, okay? It just an echo chamber. It takes those shock waves and just shoots them, you know, out. So being prepared is being prepared for any disaster or emergency situation that may come before us. And scripturally, it tells us we need to be prepared. Now, I'm going to tell you about some things from a military perspective. I'm watching my watch here. I took it off, so it's not on my wrist, but there are things called posse comitatus, which is federal law, and posse comitatus says that uh, the military cannot be used to enforce laws and policies of the United States, okay? And the military takes that quite seriously. But there is a, <clears throat> a trump card, not being a pun on words, there is a trump card in uh, federal law called the Insurrection Act. The Insurrection Act actually gives the President of the United States significant power to invoke military response to civil disorder or riots. And there, if you look and you can research it on your own, and I would encourage you to do that, there are several executive orders that address those kinds of things which you can get uh, by going online and Googling those. And you say, well, that, I don't think that's ever happened. Well, it's happened at least six major times in our country. And I'm gonna just read a few of them to you, six of them. 1863, New York City draft rights. 1932, disbanding the bonus army. I won't come back to that one. 1967, Detroit 12th Street riots. 1967, 
Newark riots. 1968, the death and murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And although I wasn't in this country, I was overseas at the time, 1982 Los Angeles riots from Rodney King. Each of those riots and dis civil disorders, the U.S. military was invoked and lives were taken. I went when I was in uniform working out of the Pentagon and Andrews Air Force Base. I had the privilege of, of uh, helping secure the deployment of 6,000 uh, Army and Air National Guard troops to the southern border and uh, for President George W. Bush and called Operation Jumpstart. Our rules of engagement, ROE, were to not fire unless ex absolutely required for defense of your own life. If there were coyotes, which are bad people, smuggling people in across the border that we were seeing through night vision goggles and stuff, we simply had to call CBP, Customs Border Patrol, and try to direct them to the spot to have them located. I don't recall anybody being killed by the military. So that's something that happened that I was familiar with, and that was, a, that was an example of posse comitatus being adhered to. Um, but I want to tell you one quick story about the uh, disturb disbanding of the Bonus Army. In 1932, President Hoover had a bunch of World War I veterans that had camped out in Washington, D.C. And they were demanding, rightfully so, benefits from their service in World War I, a, a pension. They equated to, in that time, about $9,000, which would have got them through the Great Depression. Okay, it's equivalent of about 20, 22,000 in today's dollars. Well, it didn't sit right with President Hoover. And believe it or not, he got General Douglas MacArthur and Major, I think he was a major, I don't hold me to it at the time, Patton, George Patton, to Iraq to move the World War I veterans out of their encampments in Washington, D.C. at Bannett Point. Army versus former Army, right there. And as they, on horseback and other ways, in Bannett, escorted all the World War I veterans out of their encampment, they burned the encampment so they had nothing to go back to. Is something like that in our future? I can't tell you. I don't have that crystal ball. But do I think, what do I think? I don't know. I, I, I say that primarily because when I retired in 2008 is when the Obama administration came in. And I, I don't mean to sound political, but f history and facts are what they are, undeniable. And at that time, the degradation of the military began wholeheartedly, in my personal opinion, and is continuing today, okay? Whether or not you have the military and it's important to you is where you are in life. Well, let me say this, and this is part of where I want to talk about. This is a Veterans Day speech that I give. In 19... Uh, let me get the year right, 1945, there were 140 million people in this country. Of that 140 million, 16 million patriots served in the military in uniform, World War II. As soon as it was over, they got out, a lot of them, most of all of them. Roughly 11% of all Americans fought in World War II, 11%. Compared to today, there are 332 plus million people living in the U.S. with less than, less than 1% of all Americans are in our military. 1.3 million patriots currently serving in our military. That's it. Guard, reserve, active duty, everything. 
Today we have 17 million veterans from all conflicts and war alive, 6% of our nation's total population. To go further, um, it, it, we have about 235 World War II veterans dying daily. By 2032, there more than likely will be none left in America. They're dying. The youngest right now is 96. The point is our military is shrinking. 67% of military age adults, high school graduates and up, are not eligible for military service for different reasons. 67%. Think about this. If we don't have a military that is relying purely, not purely, predominantly on technology for sustainability, that's one way of looking at it. I think we're missing the boat on the importance of the historical value of the individual person wearing the uniform of our nation, no matter what branch of service it is, okay? But if we don't have the ability to inspire today's youth, so to speak, to the importance of service to our nation, then we're looking at, in your lifetime that our military being not effectual. To me, that's unacceptable. That brings a lot of potentially bad things happening. So, um, I've got about six, seven more minutes. In your handouts, and we can talk about this, I'll give you, I don't want to get into the detail of it, there are two pages of interesting times in America. That's a list of things that I have gleaned over a period of time in the last two and a half, three years that are happening in this country. That any one of them is enough to give, our, give ourselves concerns that we, something is not right going on right now. And I'm, like I say, I don't want to make this a political statement. It's not. It's factual, it's life. Just ask yourself, I don't care who's in the White House, who's in Congress. I don't care who's in the charge of the, the, the national and state and local governments. Is your life safer and better today than it was five, 10, 12 years ago? Is it better? Life should be getting better each day that we live. It should be getting safer. I don't care, is it, in your life. I'm not talking about earning capability or money. The other page that is interesting that I hope to get a lot of questions on is a list of things to consider being prepared for all contingencies that may come your way. Think about this. Here's a scenario, short and brief as it may be. You're driving up to the window at Chick-fil-A and you're ordering something. And while you're sitting there waiting on your order to be given to you, power goes off. The light, street lights out on the street don't work. The building lights don't work. You can't get fuel at the gas station. If you get home, what's going to happen? You don't have any electricity there. There's all kinds of scenarios, and they're somewhat potentially doomsday scenarios. Whatever they may be, you need to think about being prepared for different situations. If there's no electricity, you're not going to get gas to go anywhere. So how are you going to get by day to day? What's your water source? What is your food source? What, how do you know what's going on in the world? If there's no TV, can you do it by hand? Crank? By the way, there's a typo on that one page that uh, lists some of the things to consider. And it's down at the bottom. It's not Hank crank, it's hand crank. It's, it's a radio, it's a flashlight, it's, uh, it has uh, rechargeable batteries that you can crank with a uh, gyro 
and, and, and wound up and keep, keep uh, in communications. So those are a lot of things. I'm gonna mention some names. I hope I get through the Q&A section, but there's things like Big Berkey, Alexa Pure, water purification, uh, precious metals. You don't have to own Fort Knox and precious gold, but have something that you can use to barter with. Think about things like constitutional, 90% silver, smaller fractional increments of it to be able to go out and buy a loaf of bread or something if it exists. Something you can barter for life-sustaining uh, things with. Uh, if there was a uh, radiation, a nuclear attack, you want to have something like potassium lodide available, tablets you can take and, and help until the radiation poisoning potential diminishes. Uh, is that, yes, ma'am. Uh, potassium lodide, L-O-D-I-D-E. Uh, I mentioned earlier to uh, Anna before she left, uh, go to a website called MyMedic. It's not just your, your routine first aid kits. In fact, on that list you see that term IFAC. That stands for a individual first aid kit, but that is a whole lot more than just band-aids and meal sporing. And not, not to discredit what that is, but it's, it's, it's almost survivability. Um, I've always thought it is a matter of uh, something that can benefit your health and nutrition. You know, we see it on TV all the time, balance of nature. You get a case of bottles of that, I don't know how expensive it is, or some knockoff version of it that has some uh, practicality and some, uh, what is the term, uh, not feasibility, but uh, there's a term for it. But if, if it is a good substitute for vegetables and fruits, to give you the nutrition you need and a capsule, when you have hard times and you can't, there's no grocery store and you can't get it, that will help you in your life sustainability. Don't forget about your meds. Google black seed oil. Okay, Google black seed oil. What is the quote that says, it'll cure everything but death? Okay, liquid gold. Don't forget your pets, and uh, I think I'm at the end of my time. I, I want you to go ahead and take about 15 more minutes. <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to share this because people on the internet are not looking at your list. So oh, yeah, they're not. Well, that, that's up to you, you, you do. Okay, let me, let me find that. Hold on just a second. I don't, somebody give me one, because I, I don't think I have se separate sheets. Okay, good, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the, in the, uh, the side called Interesting Times, what I have noticed over the years, over the years, uh, this country has become a little bit polarized with, uh, there are people in the middle, but there's people that only look at, get their news certain ways, and there's people that get their news other ways. Some are conservative, some are more liberal. That's just a fact of life. But I have noticed some of the mainstream, quote, mainstream media folks do report circumstance and fact, not fiction, fact, a little differently than others do, okay? I'm trying to put that as correct as I can. I don't use the word political either, okay? But these are things that draw me to great concern for the status of our nation today, okay? Interesting times. Do you realize that According to Gateway Pundit, 96 U.S. food plants and facilities have been damaged, destroyed, or impacted by allegedly accidental fires and other events like airplanes crashing into three of them from 2021 up till now. Do you fully believe 
and this fringes on political a little bit, do you believe that the last presidential election was completely above board in all regards? I'll put it that way. The COVID pandemic showed how manipulated our the thunder cracked on that one, didn't it? Was that an answer or what, Lisa? <laughs> the COVID pandemic showed how manipulated our society can be. And the government policies picked winners and losers. Small businesses suffered while the big box stores flourished. That's wrong on any level. The Fed, which is not a federal agency, the Fed is attempting to bring about digital currency and institute the 2006 Hamilton Project, Project Hamilton. Go research Project Hamilton and the Hamilton Project. They're two different things. One is a subset of the other. Project Hamilton is a subset of the Hamilton Project, which Hamilton was our first Secretary of the Treasury, is a joint research initiative by the Boston Fed and MIT to explore the feasibility of central bank digital currency, which will, has been reported, it could be erroneous, it's whatever channels of information you choose to believe, it will limit you on your bit spending ability and control everything that you buy, when you buy it, and how much you buy. Okay? I don't like that as a free person. Okay? We surrendered 80 four billion dollars worth of military equipment to Afghanistan in the absolutely worst action I've seen our government take in my lifetime. Okay? Now, why did that happen? Well, there's lots of reasons, but I will say this, having been in the military, the military industrial complex is a cyclic endeavor that, that um, has to make money and survivability by upgrading our technology all the time. So when our technology was becoming what it was, if we don't have access to some of that because we lost it all in Afghanistan, we have to have uh, bidding processes to upgrade our technology through new opportunities to resupply our military with, tech, with those pieces of equipment that are required to combat in war. Take that for what it's worth. Have you, are you aware that we've spent over $200 billion in the country of Ukraine, which is historically one of the most corrupt countries in the world? Are you aware that there are 800,000 children missing in the United States, i.e. the new movie that's a hit, and I'm glad it is, the sound of freedom that addresses that. Millions of acres, many of them have been sold to foreigners. Many of those acres are near our, our nuclear launch sites throughout the Midwest and other locations near military bases. We have allowed thousands of people to enter this country who had no mask, no vaccines, uh, and through, through our borders, mostly through the southern border, 24-7, well, that estimate now is over six-plus million. Millions of acres of forest 
there's a constant push to disarm the U.S. Yeah. Those who uh, are followers of the Second Amendment, you understand what braces are? They take arbitrarily, not law, not law. A rule by the ATF says that if you have a brace on a, on a, on a weapon, you take it from a, a short barrel rifle, it's now illegal to own, which instantly, not by congressional approval, but by a bureaucratic policy change, rule change, not law, they made millions and millions of Americans potential felons. Not good. Not good. Uh, monetary benefits and voting rights given to illegal aliens, non-citizens, that's happening. Uh, the military apprentice is experiencing the wokeness. You know, when you have your chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you say, I don't understand white rage. I want to know more about it. And they have on Navy ships and Navy facilities, drag queen contest. No. If you don't want the military to do military things, which is to kill the enemy and win wars for this country, then take them out. That's what they're doing. I don't want a bunch of Marines sitting around learning how to live in a foxhole with a transvestite. Okay? That's just me. When I was serving, I relied on the person in front of me, back of me, and to my side and to my right and my left. We were a team. It didn't matter what color you were, what country you were from. If we were all fighting for the same thing, yeah. my life was in their hands and their life was in my hands. Okay? Mm -hmm. Military wrestling experienced wokeness daily. It really bothers me. And when our government, our government kicked some of the most highly skilled combat war fighters out of the military because they would not get the vaccine. Right. Right. It is the most physically fit people in this planet. We lost combat strength and our vulnerability was increased exponentially because of that. Uh, 50% of the people have never heard of anything I just told you. Okay? okay. Just take that as fact. Military recruiting I touched on earlier is, is way down. Uh, it's scary. And there's clearly a, a double standard as on truthful reporting regarding political personalities. And there is no equal application of justice in our country. Look at the January 6th imprisonments, incarceration. Yeah, yeah. How much do you know about that? What did they do? Took a selfie in, in the, in the exactly. Capitol building? Yeah, yeah. What about the cocaine found in the, in the situation? Yeah. 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 Anyway, Lord, I think I've covered that list. Pretty thorough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I probably should on, on the, uh, yeah, yeah. the items. Yeah, yes. Some of the items and, and right, right, real quick. I'm surprised. At least I hope you give me that much. If you want to provide food for yourself, how you gonna do it? Okay, how you gonna do it? If you don't wanna do it yourself, maybe you can find a friend or a loved one close by that will assist you in doing that. That's hunting and fishing. Get a fishing boat. Get a gun. Know what to do and how to do it. One of the things on this list is the thermal scope. Why is that important? It has multiple benefits for you. Now they're expensive. But there's different price ranges on thermal scope, which allows you to see in dark at night when the animals are out. For hunting, that's where you're going to get the most access to your animals. Okay? Turkey, deer, whatever. 
but it also can be used to see if there's things going on out there in the dark that you don't want to happen in your where you live. Somebody coming after you. You can see pure noise, a pop or a boom, a couple houses away. You can see. Is anybody headed this way? Right. So that's for that hunting, fishing, solar generator. I think it has viability. I am not agreeing. I don't believe in EV car batteries. Don't want one. But there are certain aspects of solar energy that I think have viability. Because if it gets bad enough, certainly, you're not going to have electricity. Okay. You're not going to have electricity to go get gas, to go anywhere, to be on the road, to have propane, to be able to cook with. If you don't have access to firewood for heat and cooking, you may not have anything. But solar, if you think about it, there's different ranges of solar capability. You have a generator, that's an inverter. It takes AC, DC to AC and vice versa, whatever. And then you have batteries and you have solar panels. Now you can spend all you want to spend on solar, but you don't have to. If you, on your survivability checklist, you say, I want my refrigerator, I want my freezer, I'm going to do without my stove because it's 240 volt. I'm going to do without my a heat pump. I'll just do without it. But I will have uh, whatever. Refrigerator, I'm going to have a TV, I'm going to have a radio, I have a CPAP machine, whatever it may take, okay? You pare that down, you can get by with solar that can be recharged from the sun uh, when there's no fuel available. You can't get to it. No electricity, you can have electricity, you have sustainability. Um, the other ones, going down real quick, meat grain grinder, warm clothing. What happens if this happens in, in the winter when we have a, a bad winter and uh, it's uh, average temperature for two or three weeks is around 20 degrees and you don't have any heat in the house? Buy some flannel clothing, you know, something to keep you warm. And um, let's see what else. Safe. Let me say this. There's all kinds of ads on TV. If safe is where you keep your valuable legal items, and uh, you might want to keep stuff uh, if you're interested in, in like precious metals. But everybody says it's so expensive, and it is. But you don't have to be expensive. Um, you know, gold's 2,000 an ounce roughly, and silver's uh, 25, 30 dollars an ounce probably for one ounce. But here's what you consider doing, and this is viable, and we can talk about this during Q&A. Look at constitutional or junk silver. 90% silver made before 1968. You buy a some dimes, some quarters, some half dollars. Well, a dime might be worth $2.50. A quarter might be worth $7. A half dollar might be worth $15. Whereas a one ounce silver coin is going to be worth a whole lot more than probably $30 when things get to that point. So you don't want to spend your nest egg on survivability and sustainability and being able to eat and get access to things to help you live. I don't know what grocery stores will have on their shelves at that point, but if you don't plan for something, you won't have anything. Uh, nine millimeter, five, five, six, mag loaders, water bags, water purification, Big Berkey we talked about, Alexa Pure we've talked uh, is another one that uh, I think are real inexpensive ways to purify water. You go right out here in the creek Get you a five gallon bucket, throw it in a, a Big Berkey or an Alexa Pure, and you can drink pretty good water when you don't have access to anything else. Okay? Survival blankets, which are thin, uh, aluminum like looking blankets to keep your body heat, keep you warm. Uh, plate carrier and pack. Okay, what's a plate carrier and a pack? Ceramic, bulletproof plates. Okay, 
If you had a car and you got out on the road, I wouldn't be out on the road when things get real bad, if they do. I'm not trying to be a doomsdayer here, but preparation is everything. Breach pins are something that you can buy that's fairly inexpensive. If there's a lock on the door here and I, there's something in there I need to survive, that breech pin can get in that lock. It's not a pin. It's not a pin. Um, first aid kit, go to the website MyMedic. Impressive. It's impressive. A cook stove. There's two ways to go. Wood or if you have solar capability, go to Walmart and buy you a little air fryer, uh, convection hub oven, and you can cook a 20 pound turkey in those rascals and they only burn like 500 watts or 700 watts and hook it up to your solar uh, plug-in system and be able to cook there because your 240 volt sit down uh, range oven is gonna draw over 2200 watts of power if you plan to use it, which changes your dynamics on your solar generating capability. Uh, think about meat beforehand and after an event, uh, chicken coops, you get eggs and other meat with chicken coops, heirloom seeds, we've talked about rice grains, calm communications, oh my goodness. You know, I was just talking with Laura and her, and her daughters, and they're separated, and, and you know, you got to talk to family. If you can buy a uh, handheld ham radio that can reach out and go whatever distance, some of them can be tweaked and go 100 miles, 200 miles. Uh, there was one little handheld come from a place, uh, company called Bofang that actually was... I, I demonstrated on YouTube, the guy was talking from Alabama to Washington State on it. Clear as a bell. You want to be able to talk about it. But once you get something like that, you're missing the boat if you don't practice and try it out before it's actually really needed. And the hand crank, eBay, any other location like that is a generator, small gyro generator that cranks up and allow you to listen to radios, weather band, uh, FEMA broadcast, um, has a flashlight, and all kinds of options. Um, they have hand crank lanterns. You can hang in a tent, keep, keep light going. No batteries required, no fuel required, no electricity required other than hand crank. Okay, that, Gets pretty close to everything. Well, thank you so very much. We are, uh, we've learned so much already and we're really looking forward to Lisa Marie coming. Thank you, General Hunt. We'll have you back up here in just a few minutes. Now I wanna introduce uh, a very good friend. But uh, she is the director for Wings of Refuge, uh, Louisville, and also Uganda. Uh, she had a ministry in um, Afghanistan at one point. She's been so many places that the Lord has sent her, but the key is that she's here with us today. So Lisa, if uh, the, the ministry is to bring healing to uh, spirit, soul, and body and to um, just bring people into that relationship, that healed relationship of being with the Lord. And so many people's lives have been uh, totally changed and healed as a result of Lisa and her ministry. So God bless you. Thank you, mm. Ooh, Well, so much has been said, so praise God. Um, I don't want to go over anything that's already been said. Uh, it is a place of refuge. Um, we are known for, you would say, a prayer room. We're known for um, healing, deliverance, but it is a place that um, it's supposed to be a refuge. And so it's training people 
And the main point that I kept hearing from the Lord is, and we, when we're establishing a place of refuge in Uganda, Israel, the Middle East, uh, here in the States, is that the first and most important thing is you are yourself a refuge. Um, and when you are, have gone through healing, when you are yourself a safe person, uh, this is what brings a refuge. We talk about uh, the body of Christ as being a refuge because of Jesus. He's the refuge. Um, but through my 30 plus years of what this looks like, it has changed over the years. It depends on what God's doing. It depends on the need. And so where the body of Christ has learned to be safer, we weren't so safe. Would you agree? Um, and so the body of Christ really dealing with them, uh, their own fears, their own anxieties, their own issues will make you a safer person. It also helps me to work with you. When I have dealt with my own things, uh, my own fears, my, my walls, then I am able to work with you. And for a city of refuge, which the Lord talks about, and I believe we have those cities. I believe Louisville, Kentucky, many prophecies about it being a city of refuge. One, it's right there on the river, and um, which is make, makes it very convenient. Uh, but the thing is, it hasn't been one. But the Lord is bringing it into a place of safety. You know, you can have believers or unbelievers. They can be safe and unsafe. Uh, many unbelievers can be very safe people. And so as a body of Christ, we want to be safe. We want to be open. We want, and so for what God, like what God has called me to do is not what he's going to ask you to do. And so I don't want you to leave this time of thinking, I've got all this to do. You want to ask the Lord, what are you called to do? What does your home look like? Where are you to partner? So I'm partnered with multiple ministries. Uh, I'm partnered with the city of Louisville. The government knows about me. I work with the police. I work with first responders. responders. Our team has been trained, I would say most of them, there's a few that have not, with crisis to know what to do in a crisis. And what is that? It could be flooding. It could be anything that has disrupt your life. And so we have trained, we, we ask that they get trained. We're trained in first, I'm talking about as a whole, first aid. We're trained in CPR and we keep updating those. So you want to, if you're coming together and you want to make sure there's people in your uh, fellowship um, that are trained in these aspects. So as a whole, we are trained. We, um, so we want to work with people. We want to be open. So the main thing is our doors are open for anybody. Um, I, when I was doing this out of my home, it was 24 seven. We are getting to that. My prayer is that we would get to that as a, a bigger uh, ministry that you are available 24 uh, seven. When I'm in another country, it's 24 seven. I have a hard time finding people within the body of Christ that would want to give their lives 24 seven. So I'm on call all the time. Uh, we get phone calls. So the thing is, am I open for those people who are unlovable? And it's one thing to be open to them and then to live with them. Most of us might be able to do an hour, but a city of refuge, a place of refuge is to be able to do that for however long it takes. I have never uh, cut off a uh, relationship with anybody. There's maybe two in over 30 plus years that the Lord said, you have to sever ties with this. Are you willing to walk alongside? Are you willing to have your home open? We've had multiple people stay with us. Many times I've come home and I say, honey, we, I've, I've got someone with me. <laughs> and and there, he's like, uh, okay, you know. Uh, and so are, are you willing to be, you know, it's just this comfort that we really need to deal with. You know, it's okay if I go and I do it nine to five. 
It's okay if I go away and I do it for a weekend. We are way past that. Way past that. My heart cries out. It's got to be a 24-7. It's got to be the one that you think, I can't love that person. When we're moving in the fullness of the love of God, we won't be so caught up in signs and wonders because the sign and the wonder will be the fullness of love. And that is where the power of God, that's where he is. We will be deceived by signs and wonders. I love signs and wonders. I move in signs and wonders. I love the supernatural. But I have always pursued love. Everything else comes after that. I totally believe in miracles. But we're going to have to have a miracle for the water. We're going to have to have a miracle. But it's so, he says, for those who believe, for those who trust me, for there are certain things for those who believe and those who don't. And he's talking to the body of Christ. You will walk like this. You will see this. And I'm, so this is what creates a refuge. I've had people being angry or fearful when I've allowed certain people to come into our, our building. I can't stay with that, or I, I don't know what to do, or they're this, or it's just hits fear, or you didn't tell me. That's like, whoa, I didn't know. You didn't tell me. I'm like, you're going to be, you need to be moving where you don't know squat until the very second. So the main thing is, and I'm, I know I'm speaking to the mature believers that they really hear the voice of God. That's where our obedience is. And called to very difficult things. But right now, you're getting triggered. You're getting, <laughs> your fears or anxieties or things are getting hit. He goes, because this has got to go. Because what's coming, and we say that like, I've lived in that place. I don't know what's coming. I was on a committee with the city of Louisville uh, preparing for Y2K. It seemed like it was very real. But what I saw was those who were willing to let go of everything and those who were fearful. And I'm talking about the, these are all Christians. You have got to let go of what you think you need. And again, I'm saying you're, you're saying yes, but are you allowing this in your home? Are you opening the doors of your heart completely? Because then if it happens and then you're saying, oh, I'll let someone in now, you won't be ready. And yes, grace, mercy, absolutely. But those cities um, in the Bible, when it talks about refuge, you have people running to you that don't fit your mold. We've had people come and we've dealt with the court systems, the, po the, the police, I've dealt with families, and you're like, God, what are you saying? What do you want me to do? Very disruptive. I've had people like snatch people out of hospitals, bring them because of what family was doing. And I'm like, I'm going to obey the Lord. I mean, a lot, a lot of this over the years, but I'm ready. I'm ready. Are you ready for that? Have you encountered those things? Sometimes we want to stay in our little churchy cocoon, and when that all kind of disappears, like, well, what are you going to do? It, the, my, no one can take my freedom away. I, I get it that we want to fight for this country. Absolutely. We are so blessed. Nobody can take my freedom away. I I. You, it, it's this fear of someone could literally take your freedom. They can't. As a born again believer, you can't be any more free than you are now. Amen. But it's believing. And so when this stuff starts ramping up, like, what is that? I mean, when you're faced with hundreds, um, when we were in I, I, Iraq and I ran, I was surrounded by hundreds that didn't know the Lord. And it could have been a riot. But what, are, what is your job to do? I'm bringing peace. When you carry the person of peace, 
You don't have to worry. And the atmosphere was like a whirlwind just shifted. And these people that don't know the Lord asked, were asking, crying out, please touch me, please pray for me. It was like, whoa, I didn't do that. Jesus did that. But it was my abiding in him, my obedience to do things I'd never done before, to go into places where people said you couldn't go, but he said, you're going. I'm like, all right, here we go. Ham radios. We're tr most of our team is trained in ham radios. We have a ham radio. It sits in my office. We test it from time to time. Had a friend come in years ago, put an antenna on top of our building. I got the hand crank. I got all this. But the thing is, I, my heart is ready. I, you, I, you would say to yourself, I still get offended. I still get fearful. I still, maybe my opinions. I want church to look like this. Well, you got to get over it. That's not why you're here, is to have church look like you want it. It's really just the opposite. To live in the boldness of, I'm a refuge. And when I'm a refuge, then I bring other people who want to be re a refuge. When you go in to take territory, we're uh, establishing a refuge in downtown Louisville. Whew, there's going to be, a <laughs> mm, you know, yeah. but I'm watching God. And it is the most beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I ministered downtown for a long, long time. But now he said, you need a place. And I was like so excited and how he provided it was supernatural. And it's, it's amazing. But I want my doors open. I don't lock my doors. I don't lock, we don't lock our door at home. It wasn't because I, I'm arrogant. It's because the Lord said, don't lock your doors. You don't do what, again, what I'm called to do. I've had people come up with guns and the Lord literally put a shield where they couldn't get any further. But it's a, a company of people that abide so powerfully in the rest and the peace and the joy of the Lord that you take that, you change. Everything that we've heard today, absolutely. Gardens, do this, absolutely. Water, absolutely. We've done all that. We have many things in, you would say, our toolbox, our arsenal. But what if? So you know what? I have I have a lot of canned goods. <laughs> I have a manual opener. What if you don't, can't grow? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. You learn how to rotate your canned goods. You're not maybe called to have a garden. It's okay. You need to hear what God is asking you to do. I used to live on a farm. I wanted, I wanted wings to be out in the country. He said, you know what? <laughs> You're going to the city. I was like, ah, oh, all right. There's got to be a safe place because, you know, more people are moving back to the cities. More people are moving downtown. Amen? Because they moved out. There's some coming back. Is there going to be a safe place? I'm connected to all the ministries and churches around me. I'm not telling them what to do. They're not, t but we're all, this is what they have. This is what I have. And we come together. You know, there's things to argue about and there's things not to argue about. The things that you think are important aren't important. What's important? That you believe in Jesus Christ, that he died, that he rose again for me, that he is my healer. Because let me tell you, yes, first aid, I have first aid kits everywhere. But you know what I do first? Pray. My, one of my spiritual sons says he has a bracelet and he said if he's in an accident, call Lisa Marie. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> I said, why'd you do that? I said, why'd you do that? He goes, because you're going to pray. You're going to raise me from the dead. I said, well, praise God. <laughs> Amen. I believe I was in Uganda. There was a serious accident. Remember, you are the refuge. 
if you believe. He said, for those who believe, Psalm 91 is in my everywhere. Yes. I, because I believe. Yes. People were quoting it. Yes. They weren't in it. I believe in being in it, to be revelated. We had a horrible accident. The driver hit a woman. Listen, if you do that in another country, you, it could be horrible, horrible. A couple pastors, one of my intercessors, and immediately she had a baby. She was on a bike. This resurrection life, I just wah, came out. The baby wasn't breathing. The baby, the mom, it was horrible. All of a sudden, bam, the baby starts breathing. But it happened so fast. And then all the culture. So if I'm the refuge, I, all my eyes are on Jesus. They are saying, okay, you, this is what you shouldn't. You should never do this. They would tell you, never do this. I did it because God said so. I'm taking care of the person we hit. I'm waiting, I'm working with the police, uh, I'm, and they're saying normally, often people will run, they'll take off. I'm like, why would I do that? I, I don't need to protect myself. I am to love God with all my heart, and I am to love others. I don't have concern about myself. And if you're with me, sometimes it gets a little unnerving. But I believe that is how we are to be as a body of Christ. We don't need to, God's going to take care of me. It's a promise. To those that don't believe that, we're to help them. And that could be the body of Christ. It can be an unbeliever, it, well, however it looks like. So the challenge is, do I really walk in that? I can say yes, but have I walked in that? Have I faced these circumstances head on? Was I available for the supernatural, for the God, the living God, to move through me and change the circumstance? I have been in thousands, but it's me growing in who God is. I'm, I'm like, I'm always, you got, I'm always learning, always growing in who He is. I told someone, I said, if you wake up and you're still thinking about you, then you still need to die some. If your agenda is on your heart, if your thoughts are about what you're going to, you need to die some more. To be so available to the Lord. You know, and a refuge, a city of refuge is accessible. Are you accessible? I want to make sure like our building is accessible. What we're doing downtown, I'd like to get you know further in opening the doors there. But when we're there, we're accessible. Are you accessible? Is your life accessible? Or do you guard it? Is it totally open for the Lord? To totally? accessible. So those cities of refuge were accessible. They were the most accessible, accessible, and that was on your list, accessible cities in uh, Israel, in their properties. Also, remember, it's the priest. So we are priests. Yes. So the priest is, doesn't have opinions. <laughs> okay, okay, it's, a little fire on those opinions. They didn't have opinions. They weren't politically correct. They weren't Democrat or Republican, you know, because God's not. So they could hear. They listened to the case that came. They kept the person safe. They didn't go by gossip. They didn't go by what they heard. Facts. They stayed on the course, and that's who we're to be. I, when people come in and they say, well, you ought to know, and you should. I'm like, no. Stop. I don't want to know nothing. You don't need to tell me anything. I'm trying to sway you to believe as I believe or what I think. Uh-uh-uh. Not a city of refuge. Not a place of refuge. And again, it starts with you. You're a refuge. You can be a refuge. Maybe you're a little bit or you're on these moments, but not. don't have my weekend.
So a city of refuge. We talk about um, forgiveness a lot and true repentance. That would be the, the air that you breathe as a refuge. Grace, mercy, compassion. If you yourself have some unforgiveness, you need to deal with that. And you can tell, you're like, oh no, I'm good. I'm like, okay. Why are you angry? Why are you got that wall? What, what's going on? So I need to know that I am in full forgiveness as far as I know, as far as the Lord tells me. But I'm always praying the prayer in Psalm 139, Lord, you search my heart. You search my heart every day. I pray that prayer. I pray your, your kingdom come, your will be done every day. But, I, but it, it's not rote to me. I mean every word. Communication. And, um, the most important thing is now. Like, am I listening? Are we talking? Are you being honest? Are you a person of integrity? Can what you tell me be trusted? We have a confidentiality policy and we take it to the nations. You sign this. And it, let me tell you, the body of Christ hasn't been very good with confidentiality. So many people even get upset because they won't, I won't tell them. Well, I know my husband's there, so it's okay. I'm like, well... Um, don't come to me. You need to go to him. My friend's there. Can you tell me? Nope. And our team from time to time, they'll tell you they need to like, okay, I need a refresher. I need to go deeper with listening, confidentiality. I don't need to know. I need to get rid of some fear. Every time we're going deeper, there, the, that, the God is so big. We all continue to go deeper into the Lord with what we think we know. And that, that can be a big stumbling block, what you think you know. <laughs> like I could, I feel like I could write a book with all this, you know, just being a place of refuge. But I said, Lord, what do they need to hear? So what do they need? Why are, they, why are you here? Why did you come? Well, again, you want to be the refuge. You confront and you also, what does it look like? If it's your house, you have neighbors. Mm -hmm. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. Oh, that person that I maybe wouldn't hang out with, am I really loving with them? Mm -hmm. Our flesh can love so far. But when you're abiding in the supernatural love of God, you don't feel you're not offended, you're you're just in a whole other realm. But when you're in the flesh, you get offended. You have expectations. You have these wants and desires that are outside the love of God. And don't hear what I'm not saying. He puts desires in me. But it's kind of like I give those desires back because I trust him to do those through me. As I abide in him, as I trust in him. So trust, there's just, you say you trust, but then you'll say, well, I really don't trust this person, or I really don't trust that. You have an issue with the Lord. He was perfect trust. He was a person of trust. He trusted the money to who? You've heard this before. But Jesus didn't have mistrust, like so many of us can carry mistrust by something that has happened. We, if you keep things in your mind, you need to deal with that. You shouldn't have any Rolodex. You shouldn't have, well, you know, I, I just love Michelle. You know, but I, I, I don't know. You can't have the butt in there. <laughs> so my heart wants to walk in purity. That I can, because that can create a wall with someone, a brother or sister, and prevent just that fullness of the Lord that he wants to do between us. So opinions we might have with people, walls. I'm talking about some, a real refuge where someone runs and they have committed a crime. What do you do? Do you form your opinion because of the crime they committed? 
uh, we had a gentleman spend the night, this was several years ago, and a gentleman that was, we have people that spend, uh, stay with weeks, and they can stay for anywhere, you know, one, two, four nights. And when he found out why the man was there, he got upset. I said, well, this is who we are. If you can't handle it, that's okay. You can leave. This is who we are. Or if someone comes in that has a disease, do you get a I mean the fear in the body of Christ with sickness and disease is spirit is stupid. I'll just say <laughs> <laughs> when someone says I don't want to go in there because I'm sick, I'm like, well, no, you're supposed to come. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. I am not thinking I have to protect myself. During COVID, we never shut in. Never. And we were bombarded with a lot of anxiety. I thought about the body of Christ. And of course, a lot of sickness, fear, uh, depression. You can have all the stuff, but miss him as a refuge. So are you prepared for those people to come to you? You need to do it now. You need to be prepared now. I don't care who comes to our house. God sends them. Well, come on in. We can't just be okay with a certain body of Christ. We can't just be okay with, well, I'm okay with my family. No. So to practice now what that looks like. So his, it's your heart that now is getting tested. Your heart is being in the fires of affliction now so that you will have peace. You will have joy. You will bring healing. You will be what God has called you to be and where he's put you. You know, if he's put you out in the country, praise God. If he's put you in the city, the suburbs, wherever it is, there be the refuge. We just last week we had someone walk in our building downtown and I would say 90% of the body of Christ couldn't have dealt with it. And so as we listened, we sat peaceful, you know, big demons can walk in. I'm like, whoa, hi. You know, I'm not looking. I'm not, I've got my eyes on Jesus. I'm like, Jesus loves you. So tell me, Jesus, how you're helping this person. And after an hour, he experienced, he could say, I felt the healing. May I come back? I'm like, absolutely. Took a card, took numbers, took times. But I knew that when we met him and brought him in, the Lord was very strategic and also protecting some people. This is vital. When I hear people say, well, I just, I won't do that or I can't do that, I'm like, you know what? You need to deal with that. Because I don't have a no or a can't with my father. Whatever he's going to ask me to do, I know that he will prepare me and has been preparing me. But again, don't wait till it hits. I've been on scenes of massive crisis, death everywhere. Are you ready? People burnt to a crisp. Are you ready for that? People even in the country I was at, they, they're like, I can't. I'm like, okay, I'll go. Again, it's not arrogance. It's not arrogance. It's the grace of God in that moment. But you, I have built a history with the Lord. So you're like, Lord, I need history with you in this. I want to be strong in whatever you've called me to do. And so we're always, how things shift in our building and times and seasons and things, we're just keep moving with the Lord. And let me tell you, the intercessors say it's, it really hits things in them when the shifting and changing happens. But they welcome, like, okay, God, deal with me. Because of our comfort, I got to have my water. You know that special green water? 
I got to have that purple pink stuff. I got to make sure that I'm not hot. Someone said, I'm not going over there because I'm hot. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> okay, you know, I'm just going to pray for you because if you don't have any air conditioning, if you don't have any light, you're going to get hot. <laughs> and I don't like heat. And then he sends me to the equator. Is that just not Jesus? And, you know, desert, Egypt, and, you know, I'm like, God, it's hotter, it's so hot, Sudan, whoa, burning up. But God, he gives me little things, he tells me what to wear, he, he helps me, and then I don't feel it, because it's not about me being comfortable. Amen. I laughed when I was in the North Africa, many countries, uh, there was two people I was with, and just the, I had fans, I had cold things that you can lay on top of you, you know. <laughs> but God, every country went in. They, see, they said, you know, we have one room with an air conditioner. We're going to give it to you. I was like, Jesus, you're so awesome. <laughs> so the thing is to trust God. Did I need an air conditioner? No. But it wasn't, I mean, who'd have thought? Here I'm in South Sudan. There's nothing. And there's this little room with an air conditioner. <laughs> I just was laughing at the Lord, like, you're awesome. Of course, the other two people weren't happy, so they had to come in my room. <laughs> so I'm just encouraging you. This refuge, ah, it's you and God. It's really believing. Like he said, one day you're going to ask where that coin is. And you're going to go, and I'm going to tell you what pond to pull it out of. I'm not worried about, do I have this? Do I have that? I will go with the leading of the Spirit. I was praying for coins. I was praying, should we have coins? Should we have cash? And the way the Lord provided it was just crazy. So again, obedience to His voice, not the pressures of the world, not the pressures of religion, not the pressures of being correct, but the abiding, a true resting in him, waiting. You know, we recently did some things on waiting. Waiting on the Lord is, well, I'm not moving till you move because if I move before you move, I'm toast. And there's been situations like that. I'm like, I'm waiting. It takes a waiting on a whole nother level. Have you waited? You know, sometimes it's hours, days, months, years, but truly waiting for the God to move and move you in the past power of love. People say, oh, look at that signs and wonders. Like, that's great, but you know what? I don't know. Are they moving in love? Do they, are they loving others? That's always a sign to me. Do they really love the people around them? But my love doesn't look like Laura's. So somebody might say, oh, my love looks like feeding people. I'm like, great. Do we feed people? Absolutely. But I'm not telling you that you're not loving because you're not doing something that I have been called to do. Wake up from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. and I'm praying for some people. That to me is a lot of love. When someone says I'm praying for, I'm like, thanks. I can feel the love of God because they prayed for me when... A, a, a very precise moment. So the way the love of God looks has many faces. So we got to let people be who God has created them to be and love that way. Amen. 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 I think I'm done. <laughs> Okay. We're going to do some question and answers. And um, should we get back with the microphone, Paul? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so we're going to ask General Hunt to come back up. And I want you, Lisa Marie, if you would please thank you for your words and encouragement. And we appreciate that so much. And I would like for you to introduce your savings. Oh.
a whole new path. So she would be a spiritual daughter from a protege under, under <laughs> learning. Um, and so how it looks like in Mercedes, uh, she loves preparedness. She um, loves being available to the Lord. And so whatever, you know, it's just amazing how she doesn't have, well, I'm not saying you don't, you know, uh, maybe, <laughs> like, I'm not saying she's perfect, <laughs> but most of the time she is so available. You know, none of us are perfect. Amen. Um, she is so available to do what the Lord asked her to do. Um, and she's come miles from when I first met her. Um, she loves the Lord, loves people, loves ministering to people. Um, she loves when we go downtown, we feed people. That's, um, she just loves that. And I just thought, uh, when Laura said something about Mercedes, I went, huh, I love it that she's 20 something. Because we, most time you see people in this when they're older, retired. And really the young people need to hear uh, someone that's there and what they're seeing and believing and doing. Amen. <laughs> um, Jean, do you want to, can we get a chair and you want to come back up and sit on this panel too? Okay, all right. Well, uh, we are going to take questions from the audience. Elaine is still here, Jean's back. Um, and so we're going to take questions. Uh, so who has a question? Yes. Okay, okay, the question is for a ham radio, do you have to have a license? Yes, you do. It's not terribly complicated or, or hard to get, but let me say this. If uh, other than just familiarity, if you ever really need to have one, who cares if you have a license or not? That's my personal opinion. It's survivability, but yes. If you want to practice with it, get used to it, you should have a license. Like, will someone come and can we be fined if you're practicing with it? We ordered the one that you had just mentioned. I can't even say the name of it. Uh, Bofang? Yes. And I, saw, I didn't know if that had to have a, to practice or anything. My it depends on, there, there's so many different radios with that brand name. Okay. It depends on what it is specifically whether you need a, 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 a F, uh, FCC license or not. Okay. You may not, or you may. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, I just, just wanted to add to that, like I said, all of us, most of us have had training, and we got tested with the ham radio, and, and then, of course, you want to practice. So, there, that, again, between you and the Lord, um, but you might, and it's, we've been, to, we went to a fire station. Okay. So there's mid, it's, there's lots of places that will help you, but you can go online and they can tell you and get you ready for the training. Okay, can I ask just one more thing? Without a, an antenna, just a handheld one. Yeah, the hand crank, what you were talking about, power. Okay, okay the quit, let's repeat the question, Howard. Uh, you're, you're talking about an antenna, hand crank, and all that for a ham radio or a communications device. A hand crank will work. Uh, there are antennas uh, that on on a handheld that are about 42 inches long, one inch wide. They're kind of a, a wide whip. When you fold it over, it has the receptability of its extended capability, 42 inches. Different antennas. Are, are associated with different phone, uh, different radios, and it is critical that you match the best antenna with your radio, because okay. what is often supplied with it is not the best antenna to get out for distances. Okay, so oh, I, didn't, I didn't repeat. You're talking about antennas and, and the hand crank capabilities. Move on uh, to another area of questioning. So, does someone else have a question? Could you just spell the name of that brand of radio? Spell. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Lisa, how about S? B B A B A E F O A N G, I think. Biofang. It's from China. Everything's from China, y'all. You don't believe it? Look. One, one thing I wanted to just, uh, sometimes you can find even walkie-talkies. So we've had some walkie-talkies that can go for a, a couple miles. So those are good with your community. So you, CB radios, walkie-talkies. So just again, you're asking the Lord, what do we need? Okay, other questions? I thought I saw some hands. Mike? Howard, you talked about the Insurrection Act. It's got to be turned on up there. Michelle's got to turn it on. There it is. You were talking about the Insurrection Act and the power it puts in the hands of the president that could, gives them, you know, all the military and National Guard, whatever he thinks needs to be done. You gave some examples, but the, you know, the latest alleged insurrection was January 6th of 2020 who our president at that time was President Trump. So I just wondered if you had any comments about that particular insurrection or any speculation as to what, if any, actions President Trump might have taken between January 6th and January 20th of that year. Well, it, uh, Mike, I'm sure you understand that as regards the, the, the insurrection of January the 6th happening at the Capitol building, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is in charge of the Capitol Police Force and, and so on and so forth. President Trump or his staff made a call, my understanding, I, get, I wasn't there in the room, to the Speaker's office to say if they, she, they felt they needed more security for the January 6th rally, that he would suggest that they call in the National Guard and the military to provide that security. That did not happen for whatever reason. And so that was authorized not to enforce law to provide public safety to the, to the potential uh, participants of the January 6th rally. That's what my understanding was, and it didn't happen. Okay, other, other questions? Anyone have questions about preparedness? I'm kind of interested in the solar generator and also a gasoline one. So would you like, I mean, the sun's not always out, so what kind of um, a guarantee would we have that we're going to have electricity all the time we need it? Or should we, like, rotate gas generators and the solar generators at the same time? Clyde, I don't know what the right answer on that is because I think if situations are dire enough, there won't be any electricity to pump the gas out of the fuel tanks at the service stations. You won't get it. Everybody knows that fuel has the, the life of about uh, uh, 12 months. Diesel does for 12 months. Gasoline is, is one to three months of usability unless it has additives put in it that can uh, uh, stabilize it for up to a year. But if you don't use it, then it, it's uh, of no no usable value to you okay so it may not be there when you need it and yes the sun's not out right now you could do solar an hour ago when it was raining and and everything you couldn't do solar but if you get between four and six hours sunlight a day if you can you're going to generate enough wattage to be able to run your home at night when you don't when you need the refrigerator on when you need lights on and so on and so forth. But in doing that, you have to scale down your demand to a, to a survivable level. You're not gonna have your heat pump, your hot water heater, you're not gonna have all your 
everything on in the house at the same time like you might now. So you scale your wattage uh, capacity down to a level that is survivable. And I believe solar, which you don't have, it's free once you have the system. You don't have to go get it. You don't have any storage problems. Remember, you have the battery where it's stored, which in the interim, until you have no electrical power in the house AC, you can charge a solar generator up with the house current. So you can use the house current at night, flip a switch, and use solar, at, I mean, during the day, you use solar, and at night, you uh, use uh, less expensive AC house current as a, as a cost saver. Here. Um, my question is for Lisa Marie. So, if you, when you first got started, uh, because I'm in the process of opening up uh, a recovery ranch for women who have been rescued from human trafficking, uh, domestic violence, things like that. Um, and so, when you first got started, when you go out to the community, do you reach out to just all the churches in your area? Do you reach out to the court system, how do you let people know that you're there and available to help the women? I really didn't do anything. So God just brought them? God, and people still ask, well, are you advertising? We've never advertised. Right. Um, and it was just open doors and- Word of mouth just and Just being stuff. Yeah. and doing what God told me to do. I, Right. I mean, we don't even fundraise, which has been a, some people don't agree with, but I'm like, it's just, that's such a system of the world. Um, and so really trusting the Lord for everything. Right. That's where I I'm mean, at. When I had a, uh, so it's just, and I could have, I started out kind of like that, but the Lord goes, no, I want you to be there for everybody. Like you're, I did a lot of that and. But the Lord said, well, it's a place for all people. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mercedes, I'll go ahead. Okay. Um, so my questions, I've got three as for the general there. One, do you have a um, solar generator that you would recommend? Um, I don't own one. I have done some research in, online, and uh, right now, today, in the 11th and 12th of July, f uh, fortunately, if it were available, there are systems out there. Uh, there's two uh, that seem to the surface to the top. One that I particularly like is called Blue Eddy, B-L-U-E-T-T-I. It has the uh, generator inverter, it has a, a cable attached battery that goes with it. It's fairly portable. And then you add the solar panels to generate at night. Another name is EcoFlow. There's several out there, but EcoFlow and Blue Eddy, you go, they have their own websites. And as I was telling somebody earlier, you, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do it. It depends on what your wattage usability is on a daily basis that you're willing to live with. Right. Uh, if you want 4,000 watts a day, you still can do it fairly inexpensively, but you don't probably need anywhere near that much. Right. Okay. And I'm talking about kilowatt hours. That's, there's different watts and kilowatt hours. Okay. Um, I know I said three and I forgot, but um, you were talking about the military and how it's gone down over the years. Yes, ma'am. So um, are there any courageous commanders <laughs> still Absolutely. left? <laughs> Absolutely, there are. And, and, and I've been around some of the, the, the young men in uniform still to this day. And as I spoke at uh, Memorial Day at Camp Nelson, uh, we're losing our greatest generation but there's still a lot of great ones still out there in uniform today. I don't want to paint, I don't want to paint a completely black and bleak picture, but it is different than it has been in the past, yeah. and there's evidence of degradation. Let me put it that way. 
Okay. But there are still great leaders out there, great supporters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I want to, um, as we, um, I want each one of you to give your top two or three things that you think we need to be aware of today um, that, that, I don't know, maybe something you just want to highlight, doesn't have to be long, two or three things that you think we need to be aware of going forward from where we are. Well, I guess for me, the only th I think about is pretty much what Lisa Marie said about it all has to be start with you. So when you're a prepared individual, most of the time, I feel like we get shaken because either we didn't know something or our fences, our fears are hit. But if you're prepared or as an individual and you're dealing with your fears and your fences and all that, then it's, you don't necessarily have to know ahead of time that, say, a tornado's coming, but it's more about then you're ready to care for other people. And I don't know, this is a little, long thing to try to get through. Um, but that's often when a crisis hits, it really shows like what you believe and who you are. And so if your hope and trust is in the Lord, then you're not shaken. And you really, in your priorities, like most people think, oh, your priorities will change in a crisis situation. But if your priority has always been to love the Lord and to love other people, then in those moments, your prior, so it's not really a big shakeup to you. You're just still living life the same way you would live life. Because your pri in the world, the priorities do change. Like in a crisis situation, law enforcement their priorities are going to be a little different. They might not be responding to every call you call out because they have something they're doing, but your priorities are the same. And then the other thing is just when you are loving people and you take notice, I just kept thinking as, we're prepared, like, as we've been talking, like how many times have I driven down the same streets in my neighborhood and I'm like, oh, I never noticed that that house was white. But really when you're living prepared, you will notice those. And I think one thing as I've been talking about preparedness is knowing your neighbors, you know, who's vulnerable in your neighborhood. Knowing that there's a mom down the street that has little kids and maybe she's a single mom or her husband's gone. And so just taking time to notice those around you more will help you. One of the things that um, I'll just bounce off Mercedes very quickly, you talk about how you respond in a crisis. It's a matter of character, you know, because, you know, we saw some real character things come out during COVID you know, among the body. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Amen. Um, I wanted to go back to uh, just one thing. You know, we're talking about what should I have this, should I have that. Um, it's good to have a little bit of, so I have something that is solar. I have, like I have, a, I have flashlights that are solar and battery um, because we can't be dependent on electricity. Um, so the more that I am asking the Lord, what do I need? And also I have supplies of that. I have maybe some diapers. I maybe have some, I have these things uh, at home. I have, in case someone were to come and say I have no formula for my baby. Um, so just you're asking, again, you're asking the Lord, what do I need? Um, and who's, he knows who's going to come out knocking on my door. Um, another um, is usually sometimes you might have a family that's kind of split where you want to be prepared and your husband doesn't or the husband does and the wife doesn't so again god knows so i'm not going to force my loved ones to think as i think i'm going to do what god has told me to do and and pray for my spouse my children my grandchildren but i'm not going to force on them again to do things that god's asking me to do and so if your loved ones aren't on the same page trust the lord um it's I, i'm not getting fear and control and or shame and to tell them to do certain things so this is very critical because i've seen many people well, my husband's not or my wife's not or my kids 
I mean, God knows. And he says, you know, that gentle spirit will draw them. So I want my prayers and my gentle loving kindness to draw those. And then if the Lord has given me a word to speak to them, it's not going to be condemning or why didn't you or you should. Um, so I want these words for those. Uh, and also, they know who has peace. They know who is stable. And so that's who you need to be. You need to be that loving, stable person. Well, I agree with all that. And, you know, I was just sitting here thinking of the correlation between all these subject matter kinds of things is that the Lord wants us to be prepared to be a refuge. And by that I mean a refuge from the catastrophe of, an, uh, of a natural disaster, a man-made disaster uh, that is both worldly and spiritual impacting. Okay, so if it's impacting our family that are apart from us physically, then we need to be able to let them know what we're doing and, and welcome them into uh, that refuge aspect of being prepared for all things that we want to, uh, that may come our way, okay? And I, I spent uh, uh, many years in the Air National Guard and during those years, I responded to every major disaster this Commonwealth had from 1975 to 2006. Ice storms, tornadoes, everything. And what I know is people are going to die because they didn't plan. They didn't prepare. That is purely a fact of life. In Katrina, in New Orleans, People died because they didn't have a way to survive. They didn't cut a hole in their roof and be evacuated by helicopter. You need to think about these kinds of things. And I'm not talking about just man-made disasters, but I'm talking about natural disasters, an earthquake, New Madrid, um, whatever it may be. Spiritually, like I said, 159 times in the Bible, it talks about us as followers of Christ being prepared to deal with life differently from what we have today. So I think this has been a great opportunity, and I'll offer to hang around any time after we adjourn to answer any questions anybody else may have. Thank you for this. Does anyone have any questions for Jean before we move on to the next thing? Okay. I'll ask any, any, are we finished? Okay. Um, thank you all very, very much, and we appreciate it. And uh, we're getting ready. We're going to take Holy Communion. Y'all can be adjourned. Um, we're going to take Holy Communion here in just a minute. Um, we want to thank Terrell and Michelle uh, that Terrell Smith and Michelle Smith, this is their church, the church they pastor, and they've been so gracious to invite us in today. And so, um, yes. <laughs> Terrell is going to lead here in communion in just a minute. But um, someone pulled me aside at the break. Was it you? What did you tell me? Because it was good, and I couldn't remember what it was. Oh, yes, I remember. Uh, remedies and things that I want to know in case I'm in that. But in case we really need them, we're probably not going to have a book this year. So it's good to have a hard copy of a book. So let's just set out all the books here. So we have a library with paper. Good to have a library with paper because we may not have electricity or the internet. And then the other thing my daughter said going out the door uh, before she left, she said, I wanted to say this, but I didn't get to it. She said, talked about, you know, you can deal with um, like injuries and illnesses and things like that, but you need general health. So if your general health is not good, you do not have the stamina to walk up a hill. You can't go up the hill to get firewood or to forage something or whatever. So we need to begin take or increase taking care of our general health 
so that we have the strength and the stamina um, to go forward and do what God has called us to do. And um, I just want to take a minute of uh, personal privilege here and just share a little bit about what the Lord has been telling me about why we're even here today, why I called this meeting together. I didn't know if I was going to, but I will. I'm not going to take very long because I know we've been here a long time. But um, on June the 9th, before we met at Lisa Marie's um, house, <laughs> uh, ministry, Wings of Refuge, for a deliverance training that we did, the Lord began to speak to me about uh, doing and training in preparedness. Um, and I said, Lord, do you want me to release that generally? Or, you know, what do you want me to do? And he said, well, release it and, and train the ones that you're responsible for. Well, we've gone along beyond, way beyond that. But I guess we are in many ways. We are refuge. We are responsible for the body of Christ. But two times since then, the Lord has brought that back up again. And, it, and the, when he talked about preparedness, he, he said um, that it is time now to begin to be ready and to, and he said, you know, we're not in a crisis at this moment, but you can't wait until a crisis comes to begin to get prepared. And then um, at the end of June, uh, June 29th, he spoke to me about Matthew 24. And if you are familiar with Matthew 24, it's the sign of the beginning of sorrows, the signs of the beginning of the end of the age. And uh, so anyway, the Lord took me through that chapter verse by verse for two hours and spoke to me about that. And I'm, and I'm not going to re release all of that. But uh, basically, um, the Lord again said, this is not yet, but it is coming soon. And I said, well, you're an eternal God. So, you know, not soon to you, maybe a thousand years, he said, or a hundred years, I think I said, and he said it won't be. Um, and so he is stirring the body of Christ, and honestly, I haven't watched what Dutch Sheets released that day that April alluded to earlier, and I don't know if it has anything to do with all that. I sense that it does, but I think the Lord is really stirring in the body of Christ, and before uh, the flood, there was a time of preparation and if Noah had not prepared, he would not have survived. Uh, before the famine in Egypt and Israel, um, there was a time of preparation. And there was, as Jean said, there's faith and there's works. You have to have both. So if we know that the Lord is saying to be prepared and we just don't do it because we don't stir ourselves up, that's on us. And then again, the last time the Lord spoke to me, about this was this morning and uh, he brought it up again and he said it's time to get going you you haven't really taken this as seriously as you should have it's time now to begin going uh on this in earnest and really he said you think you're prepared but you're not and i think we're probably more prepared than a lot of people but he said you think you're prepared but you're not and it really what it really comes down to is this the people who are prepared stand a chance to survive. The people who are not prepared may not survive. So you have to do what you have to do. And I mean, I, I don't feel like we're here by accident. I think that there is a generation that is going to see the events of Matthew 24. And the Lord told me, he said, it's going to be a frightful place. But one thing that he showed me is that he was releasing that understanding of Matthew 24 and go back and read it if you haven't read it for a while but one thing that he was showing that I saw I saw the light at the end of the chapter I had always before when I had read that I had always hung up on the famines and the pestilence and the earthquakes and I never saw the light and I was so filled with hope because he will not leave us, he will not forsake us, but he is asking us to do our part. And it says if those days were not shortened, no flesh would survive. And so there is hope, there is light. At the end of the chapter, the light comes. So anyway, God bless. Yes, very briefly, come up. Oh, there you go. And then Terrell will come up. Yeah. Thank you. 
coming seven lean years, seven years of prosperity, seven lean years, uh, just like the book of uh, Joseph. But this whole day in the spirit realm, what I've been seeing is the Lord parachuting down supplies to each and every person here. Spiritual and physical, wisdom, and it's coming to every single person here, but that's what I've been seeing in the spirit. Sorry Amen. About- Amen. No, thank you so much. And uh, I asked the Lord, I said, do I need, a few years ago, I said, do I need to prepare? He said, no, you understand the kingdom and how it works. But now he's saying to prepare. And I, and even so, and Mike and I have talked about this, we have to be prepared not to turn anybody away. We have to be prepared. Okay, we're all going to, if this is all we've got, we're going to starve together. And that's a hard thing, okay? We're going to be prepared to, to divide our last piece of bread in four pieces if we need to. But... I believe the Lord will multiply, and but He's got to have something to multiply, <laughs> and so Terrell, um, get the get the mic, hun. Pandemic uh, is this that because we think about preparedness, we live in the United States in the lack of luxury compared to most of the world. But the one thing we learned through the pandemic was that. It's no problem to get toilet paper until you can't get toilet paper. Yeah. It's no problem to get hair coloring until you can't get it at Walmart because they shut down the place. And that same blank is very easily, it could be very quick if they shut down our rails and all that. It's no problem getting food until you can't get food. And when you think about that, I mean, if something really, even a natural disaster, as Howard mentioned, you know, with the, the faults and all that, could happen, but even through other countries doing things, if if the lines of transportation were messed with our power grid, our local Walmarts and grocery stores would be out of food in about less than three days. It'd make uh, snow coming in uh, the winter look like nothing. Uh, so it is something that we don't see it now, but we need to be pre- prepared for it if it comes. So thank you all. Okay, I think everyone made it to this. We're going to do this a little different than maybe we do it at church, but we're a mixed multitude. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Michelle, if you can some help distributing the communion. You know, the key, the Lord said, no man knows the day or the hour. The key was always prepare preparation, being prepared. And uh, I think of the one in Luke where he said they, with one consent, began to make excuse. And then if they make excuse long enough, he ends it. They say, well, we cannot. We cannot. And if, you know, if we cannot, that's always our decision. It's never God's. Because God giveth more grace. Amen? It's hard, not, it's hard to sit in a, something like this and not, you want to preach. <laughs> <laughs> That's what preachers do, right? <laughs> and I, I just have to be careful I don't preach to my wife. <laughs> yeah. Well, father, you want to say yeah, while they're passing that out, I just want to say what an honor it is to have everyone here. Yes, it is. Flora and, and uh, Mike have been good friends for many years, and they're like family to us, and we love and appreciate them, and April and Howard and Diane and Kim, and all of you guys, you guys have been working with y'all for so many years, and uh, Lisa Marie, I just appreciate all the giftings in you all, and to see this come together here. I know we haven't been in this church very long, but we've been here long enough to know that the word of the Lord is over. It's, it's a place of training and equipping. So to have this happen here is just, uh, it's just something that God's called us to do. And uh, we're just so honored to have everybody, and you're welcome. And we have church service tomorrow, 10 o'clock, if anybody's in the area, they want to have, you are so welcome. <laughs> Intercessors meet here nearly daily. We pray and seek the Lord in our part of the Contemporary Prayer Coalition. God bless you. I will share this if I may, just a little bit of a testimony. Before we took the church, the Lord told me this is this is what He told me. These are His words. He said He needed a place where He could make an open heaven. He said this is what He told me. He said the problem He has 
with some of his churches. He did refer to them as his churches, so he was still claiming ownership. Is he said they will not let him be God in his churches. He has to follow their rules and regulations, or he can't do anything. And he said, I need a place, this is what he told us, where I can be God and I can do whatever I want. And he said, then, he said, I can bring people from other churches, touch them, and then send them back into those churches. And so that has always been our heart. We have, we never felt like this was the church, but it is a church. And mainly, it's a place where people can come and experience an open heaven. And then take it back wherever they go, wherever their community is, or wherever they go, even into their home. And an open heaven is a glorious thing if you've never done and read about it. We look at this as we get ready to take communion, and Jesus is the one that initiated this with the disciples. And he wanted them to understand, and he said the importance of it and what it represented. And he said the bread represented his body which was broken for us. It was broken for you. And you know, let me tell you something. Health does not depend on how young you are. If it did, we'd all be in trouble. But you said some very good things there. And that God, He doesn't really care how old you are. In fact, I tell people, if God starts talking to you and you bring up age, I would not recommend it. He will not be sympathetic. Did you know, did you know you can die healthy? You can die healthy. Whoever told you you have to be sick and old to die? You can die healthy and you can grow old and still be healthy. Because God made us that way and the Bible plainly states He given more grace. And which actually means you and I were all on the same level. You know why? If you need more grace, He gives it to you. We just have to know that it's there. And God give it more grace. This represents his body that was broken for you. His body was broken for you, my brother. The church might not be broken. His body was broken for you. That you might have a good health. Yeah. And this is what this represents. And when we partake of this, we're saying, Lord, I believe. I believe that your body was broken for me, that I might have good health. Let's partake of the bread. He said the juice represented his blood, which was shed for us. You see, somebody had to pay for all of our own doing. Now I know in the Air Force they pretty much do everything right. <laughs> when I went to the Navy, I'm a Navy guy, they told me right in boot camp, they're the right way, they're the wrong way, they're the Navy way. And it shall be none of the Navy way. And they meant that when they told me that. But Jesus shed his blood because he knew that he could. He knew we weren't perfect. We were going to stumble along the way. And we're born on the wrong side of the tracks. We're born in the wrong place. Yeah. And so Jesus, Jesus, He shed His blood that you might be the main whole. And that's what He said. And even the ones that abused and mistreated Him, He said, Lord, he said, Lord, he said, you forget them. He said, they don't know. So this blood was shed that you might have peace, that you might have forgiveness, that emotionally you might have healing for all the bruises that you've been through, for the difficult times in love relationships, for the times when family members have not treated you the way they should treat you. This blood was shed. So like what she said, so you might not get bitter and you might not be offended, but that you in turn, because you're forgiven, that you might 
be able to forgive. And he shed his blood for every one of us. I believe, you know, when I first got saved, I was a young man, 21. I was home on leave. Maybe I was headed for Hawaii, where I was going to live it up. Only the Lord had other plans. And when, it, when He showed me how much He loved me, I will be honest about this. I thought at first maybe He had made a mistake. And He actually thought He was talking to someone else. Because why would He love me? Why would He love me? I wasn't doing anything for Him. I wasn't living for him. I was living a, a pretty wild life as long as the Navy would let me slide in some areas. And yet I realized he knew exactly who was He knew exactly who was He knew exactly. And he said, I love you and I paid for your sins so that you might experience forgiveness and be made whole. And his blood, his blood can make us whole. But we need to believe it. We need to believe that this day that his blood was shed, that you and I might once again be whole in the way that he meant for us to be. Let's partake. God bless you. Please sign in on the sign-in sheets. Uh, we use those to give people notice of upcoming events.